It is a blessing to welcome all of you who are joining us for worship on this second Sunday of the Lenten season. You will find a bulletin in the description below the YouTube uh, invitation, and you will also find a link to uh, the giving uh, site that you can click on there and make an offering this morning if you wish to do that. We are blessed this morning to have the Reverend Karen McPhail, the rector of St. Elizabeth's in Roanoke, as our guest preacher. And we are also thankful for Peggy Howell and her offering of music. She is the organist and choir director of St. John's Lynchburg. Our worship this morning begins with a penitential order in the Book of Common Prayer on page 351. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, of an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Here ends the reading. Let us say together Psalm 22, found on page 611 in the Book of Common Prayer. Psalm 22, verses 22 through 30. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For he does not despise or abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. 
My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my, I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingships belong to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading from Romans. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there a violation. For this reason it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be also ashamed when he comes in the glory of the fa his Father 
with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the eighth chapter of the gospel according to Mark. It represents a hinge point from the first half of Mark, which dealt with the identity of Jesus, to the second half of Mark, which is about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. The first half of Mark describes Jesus traveling around, healing the sick, casting out demons, preaching and teaching, working miracles, and calling ordinary people to follow him and be part of an exciting movement proclaiming the kingdom of God. Then, just before our lesson today, Jesus stops, and he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Given all that I've said and done, what's the word on the street? Who do people say that I am? And they answer things like John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or another prophet. But who do you say that I am, Jesus asks, shifting the question just a bit and opening a door that will lead into the second half of the gospel. Who do you say that I am? Peter answers, you are the Messiah. Now, there were variations in Jewish thought about the Messiah, but he was widely expected to be a military figure from the line of David who would overthrow the occupying Roman government and establish again a royal dynasty for Israel. Jesus tells the disciples not to spread that around, not to tell anyone about him. Now, all of that came before today's gospel reading, but it's key to understanding what we hear this morning. As Jesus begins to teach his disciples what's coming next for him and about what it means to follow him. Jesus tells his disciples that he will suffer. He will be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes. Jesus says he will be killed And after three days, he will rise again. This is new information for the disciples. And this is where the movement of the gospel shifts away from Jesus' identity to what it means to follow Jesus, our identity as disciples. You see, before this moment when Jesus beckoned, come, follow me to fishermen and tax collectors, Jesus didn't give them all of the details about where they were headed what was going to happen to him. None of the people who saw Jesus heal the sick and work miracles, none of the folks who experienced something so wonderful that they dropped everything to take their place in the Jesus movement, none of them had seen suffering, rejection, and death in the fine print until now. So I think we can sympathize with Peter when he takes Jesus aside to rebuke him for saying what he said. Whether Peter is refusing to believe that a bad end could come to the Messiah, or he's finding it painful to imagine such terrible things happening to his beloved teacher and friend, or whether he feels cheated or disappointed or angry because this was not what he signed on for, any of those feelings could reasonably lead Peter to rebuke Jesus. But when Peter rebukes him, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Maybe Jesus is remembering his time in the wilderness after his baptism when Satan tempted him to abandon God's call in favor of something easier something less painful, a life that didn't have to lead to suffering or execution. Just like in the wilderness, however, Jesus stays focused. He knows what he's here to do, and he knows that what he is doing will meet opposition, not just from those in power and authority, 
but from those who say they love him and are following him, but who misunderstand what following him means. Jesus knows what he is about, what God is about, and he knows that that will provoke the powerful beyond what they will allow. And it will push many good people further than they're willing to go. Jesus knows that what the world calls success or even just an ordinary life are impossible for him if he remains faithful to his identity. So Jesus says to Peter, you are setting your mind not on what God wants, but on what you want. Peter, you're thinking about yourself. What you want me to be how you hope this will end so that we all come out on top. But we're not heading in that direction. We're moving toward the fulfillment of God's dream, not yours. Jesus is, in a sense, starting over at this point. He's called people to follow him, and crowds of people are. And by now, they've all had the chance to see and experience and hear what Jesus is all about. And the folks following Jesus are probably as ready as they'll ever be to hear from Jesus where this will all lead as Jesus continues to proclaim the kingdom of God and confront the kingdoms of this world. So Jesus looks out at everyone and he lays it on the line. He says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Jesus wants to be sure that those who follow him, whether that's Peter or Mary or you or me, understand what following him means. If you really want to be my disciple, Jesus says, if you really want to follow me and not just your image of me or who you want me to be for you, you have to let go of yourself. Following Jesus as the way to abundant, everlasting life means giving up our lives, our egos, our priorities and prejudices, Following Jesus means dying to whatever hinders us from following him. And it means setting aside the images of ourselves we've so carefully constructed and curated and that we work so hard to protect. We have to die to those things. To follow Jesus, I must die to my own life. Only then can the answer to the question, who am I, become unreservedly, I am one who follows Jesus. And only then, in that wholehearted, Jesus-following life, will we find the freedom, the salvation and peace, the abundant life that we all so desperately try and fail to construct for ourselves, by ourselves, out of our own smarts, or money, or connections and charm, our strength, or our grasping. Building abundant life on our own is about as good as trying to build an airplane out of chewing gum and bailing wire. To follow Jesus, to save our lives, to have real abundant life, we paradoxically have to let go of our lives. You have to put aside everything that you think defines you so that following Jesus is what defines you. When we understand this, then denying yourself and taking up your cross means so much more than ordering the salad when you want the Sunday or dealing with the day-to-day chronically difficult situations in your life. Denying yourself is more like opening up your hands to release whatever you've been holding on to that keeps you from grabbing onto Jesus completely. Taking up your cross means accepting where a deep relationship with Jesus, where Jesus is your life, might lead you. And accepting that where it leads 
is not success, but suffering. Not riches, but rejection. But also, also to peace that the world cannot give. Also to an abundant life we can never create for ourselves. Losing my life for Jesus' sake means that my life is now in Christ, not in my own priorities or preferences or politics. Losing my life for Jesus' sake means that no matter what else describes my life, I am defined first and foremost as one who follows Jesus. Whatever closes us off to God's work or God's dream, or God's embracing love for everyone must be set aside if we want to follow Jesus. And we will suffer because Jesus' priorities will become our priorities and our hearts will break as we look with compassion upon our broken world. We will be rejected by those who want to play by the rules of prestige and power instead of Jesus' way of love and peace and forgiveness and compassion. Until God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, until we and the whole world and all that is in it are so transformed by God's love that earthly things and heavenly things are one and the same, following Jesus means being willing to lose your life for the only life that is life, a life following Jesus. You are invited. Will you follow? Amen. Let us now affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God. The Father of the Almighty, Almighty, maker of of heaven heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Loving God, in our faith we pray for reconciliation between the violated and the violent, that we may rest in your peace, for generosity between rich and poor people everywhere, that we may share the abundance of your creation, for the growth of love between broken peoples and nations, that we may shape our common life as your kingdom, for mutual respect between immigrants and insiders, that we may welcome your image in all who come to us, for protection for the weak and humility for the strong, 
that we may serve others as you serve us in Christ Jesus. I invite your own intercessions and thanksgivings at this time. We pray especially for those committed to parish prayerless throughout our diocese. For all the joys and concerns of our hearts, that we may live with gladness and trust. Let us now pray in the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Bow your hearts before the Lord. Keep this your family, Lord, in your never-failing mercy, that relying solely on the help of your heavenly grace, they may be upheld by your divine protection. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.